day's just begun. All right. We've got some exciting things going on today. One of which uh, is this next Saturday is work day. Uh, I always enjoy work day coming together and uh, working hard and having the bite to eat. Um, if you look inside your bulletins, there is a list of 17 things that are on the to-do list for work day. Uh, if any of those things appeal to you, uh, you can talk to Brian or one of our trusty trustees um, about that and they'll make sure that you get put on the right team to help work with that project. We have some rakes here at the church, but if you want to be on the team of people who's going to help rake out the cemetery, we don't have enough rakes for everyone, so it is a BYOR event, bring your own rake. Uh, and if you can't come to work day, but you're interested in helping out with one of the, these projects, you can talk to Brian Beardsley. Uh, he is in the directory. Speaking of, um, if you have had any changes, we're starting to compile next year's directory. So make sure you fill out your connect card and give us all your current up-to-date information so that we don't publish it and then you realize that you changed your phone number a week after we published the new one. So uh, if you could keep us up-to-date on that stuff, we'd appreciate it. Uh, tomorrow, the ladies are working on uh, making cards and little gift things for the shut-ins. So if you would like to come help with that. Um, the ladies would appreciate that. Again, that is a ladies event. I want to emphasize that because I'm announcing it and not a lady. Um, so, be warned, gentlemen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, suggest coming. There's going to be a lot of estrogen in the building. Okay. Next. Okay. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm, I'm not going to dig myself a deeper hole than I already have. I'm just going to leave it at that. So. The other thing we got going on is at the end of the month, uh, on the 31st, we are doing a trunk or treating event. It's uh, going to be in a parking lot. If you want to set up and decorate a car, uh, please feel free to sign up. If you want to just kind of help out, you can talk to myself or Darlene Mills. And there is a box in the narthex for donating candy. That way we make sure we don't run out. I don't know how many visitors we're going to have. And it's better to have extra candy than not enough candy. Uh, so if somebody doesn't bring enough and we run out, we can help replenish their stock. And if we have extras after the event, we'll just give it to the kids and sugar them up real bad on Wednesday nights and send them home. Uh, so it won't be our problem to deal with. I'm mostly kidding. But my grandparents used to do that to me before they give me back to my parents, and it would make them absolutely nuts. So uh, it's fun. So all that being said, I hope you guys had a blessed week. And I encourage you to take a moment to prepare your hearts for worship. sing your praises. Lord, we ask even now that you prepare our hearts for today's message and for the worship, Lord, that we would um, be reminded of the goodness of your love. Lord, we ask that your spirit would come upon us today, that we would, uh, would, would sense your Holy Spirit nudging us in areas, Lord, that need to change, that you would open our ears to hear that, and Lord, uh, open our hearts to uh, to adjust. Lord, give us wisdom that we might uh, that, and direct our paths. Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house. Thankful to be with our uh, Christian brothers and sisters in an opportunity um, to gather. Lord, give us, uh, give us this day our daily bread of uh, your word that reminds us, Lord, there are areas in our lives that we need to change. Scripture says that we must continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And Lord, we recognize that salvation is, um, is something where we come and call upon you in our lives. And yet, Lord, in some way, we continue to work on sanctifying our lives to make it look closer 
uh, to what you would have it to be. And so what I ask even now as we talk about some hard things today, that you would open our eyes. Lord, that even now you put on our hearts those sins that we continue to live with or make excuses for or even, uh, Lord, uh, accept as just the reality of life. Lord, don't allow us to get that tunnel vision that holds us back, but rather, Lord, to uh, open our eyes to see with new eyes. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would please stand as we sing uh, him uh, 197 as Sarah Barnett leads us in blessed assurance. showed us, uh, showed me in a lot of ways, that uh, how, how relational uh, the situation for Ezra was in, in the day, today's church. And so we're going to look at chapter 9, and next week obviously we'll be looking at chapter uh, 10. Chapter 9, and, and after these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices. Like those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and the officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled my hair from my head and my beard, and I sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God, God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then after the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and, and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift my face to you. 
Because our sins are higher than the heads, our heads and guilt has reached the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of the foreign kings as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we were slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in his sight and of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through these servants, the prophets, when you said, The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons, and do not take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time, that you may be strong and eat good things of the land, and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is the result of our evil deeds and our great guilt, and yet our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are the righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, Though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. May God add his blessing as we continue to sing this morning. Hymn 353, burdens are lifted at Calvary. of the older style that, that hymns have, because there were a lot of them were written a long time ago, some of them even hundreds, multiple hundreds of years ago. But when you look at the lyrics, oftentimes they're really well thought out, oftentimes they're directly brought out of scripture, and that's not to say that modern songs don't do that as well, a lot of praise and worship songs do that. But that particular song, 
burdens are lifted at Calvary. That is a powerful reminder of how God lifts our burdens from our shoulders. How all who are weary can go to the Lord because his burden is easy and his yoke is light. And he's humble of heart. He did that for us so that our burdens could be lifted up. Speaking of lifting up, uh, this time is to celebrate the fact that we can lift things back up to the Lord and, and bless him as he has so richly blessed us. At this time, I'd like to pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings, for the way that you lift our burdens up, for how much you care for us. Lord, I pray that you would draw us ever nearer to you, that you would help us to lean upon you, uh, and that you would continue to just draw us ever nearer as we lift our burdens up to you, as you were lifted up for us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Stand up for the doxology. Okay. I was trying to remember if I remember things. You can please stand for the doxology. placed in that ferry. Yeah. And? The Nickerson family, loss of the home and the daughter. Yeah, we pray, pray for the Nickerson family, that uh, relatives of uh, 
Beth Bartlett uh, cousin did. I don't know if you heard about the fire. A uh, young lady perished uh, Saturday morning, Friday, Friday morning. morning. Friday morning. Friday morning. Yeah. Just keep that in prayer. Did you? Uh, Wednesday morning, my 93 year old brother was taken to the hospital with pneumonia and he came home Friday afternoon. Uh -huh. Clifford, right? Clifford. He's home. I would ask that you would keep Al Shaw in prayer. Uh, Al has uh, come down with pneumonia uh, this week um, and uh, is really just struggling, uh, just having a lot of physical uh, issues there. Uh, so we're just praying for God's will and all of that. Uh, pray for Donna. That's uh, This has been hard. She did actually get the seat, get in and uh, see him this week, uh, Friday. I want to say it was Friday or Saturday, which was good. Um, but he's having a difficult, uh, that's some difficult stuff. So ask that you keep it there. Uh, Carol Renner uh, has uh, uh, breast cancer. Carol? Carol. Carol Renner. Okay. She has surgery in two weeks. He? So Janet's still in the hospital. She was last week, right? She's not. She's not. Okay. Janet not doing well. I was going to ask. I see Dot's next to you. Hi, Dot. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, Ken's still in the hospital. Okay. We didn't catch that. Uh, Ken Vanderhoof is still in the hospital. Um, so pray for decisions there that would to make the best decisions that would be um, helpful for him. And then Brent Beebe still needs to have another. Uh, he still has his kidney stone, so that's not it. Anyone else? Sherry? That's a praise. You're still driving yourself, right, Alonzo? That's that's a, that's impressive. It's getting tougher. I know. <laughs> One more. One more now, tomorrow, this week. I asked for prayer for my dad. Uh, he's not here today. He he hurt his back, and I don't know. I got there. He, he's usually uh, ten thousand steps or more. He said. <laughs> He's the he's the hilarious parent that when you go to his house he he marches around the room while he's talking to you and you're like dad what are you doing well my my buzzer went off and I didn't get my 250 steps to this hour and so if I don't do my 250 steps I'll never get to 10,000 you know and so he's literally like marching around the room as we're talking um, I tell you that because uh, when I went there Friday he had a cane and I've never seen him with a cane before uh, and somewhere along the uh, line this week, he hurt his back bad enough that uh, he said, I'm only going to get 4,000. I'm like, Dad, I think 4,000 was too many. And you just need to take it easy for a couple of days. Uh, but something, he did something to his back. So he's not, he wasn't able to make it to church today. And, uh, it was pretty sore. Jim? Yeah, we want to continue to pray for our country and uh, Amen. our so called leaders. And uh, maybe they get their act together here. Put, right. Yeah, pray for pray for our leadership because they need to, to uh, and that's across the board. I don't pick, you don't have to pick a side to realize that nobody's a leader. Nobody's really doing it. The leadership uh, as a whole needs to be leadership. So, yeah. Hazel. Pray for Lori. There's a holdup 
on paperwork for Dan's last check, and uh, she's sure frustrated because they really haven't contacted her like they should have. But just pray that that goes through. And for Tom and Deb Wright today, they're not here because of a problem in the basement with water all over and drains, and so pray that goes well for Tom. Bertie? Frank Sheldon in prayer on Frankie's home, um, but what he had or what he has, what they weren't able to do anything with what he has, and that's so. There's so the images are. Go ahead. Those. His his white cells aren't high enough to do the next step yet, so he's okay. got a big gap where he needs to rest. But he is out of the prison, as he calls it. <laughs> So he's happy to be home, but he still has to drive to Cleveland to get lab work done regularly. Um, the donor kits have gone out to family members, and it's a hassle to get it completed, but we want a good donor for Frankie. So we, we pray that one of the boys is, is a good, good match and that Frankie's lab work will improve so that he can go in and get the rough stuff done. Yeah, so we're praying for uh, one of the brothers to have a match bone marrow wise um, because that's really what he needs long term. Uh, so we're asking for prayer over that. Uh, Janet? Our son. Pray for recovery for them. Quick recovery. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that even as it, crazy as it sounds, that we could talk to the creator of the universe. We were able to do that. And to bring our cares and concerns to you is just Oh, amazing. Lord, we thank you that uh, you are good and you are mighty and that you have a plan. And Lord, as we have walked through 2020, there have been some real challenges. And there have been some sense of, let's just forget 2020 and move to 2021. And yet, Lord, we have watched you work in our midst. We have watched you work in people's lives and have challenged uh, our faith in different ways, and Lord, stretched us and grown us, and uh, Lord, through all of that, uh, we continue to walk the path that you have set out in front of us, and so Lord, we thank you uh, for as difficult as it has been in some ways, uh, we thank you that you are still in control and on the throne. Lord, we pray for Sharon Hartman and the situation that she's dealing with. Uh, Lord, on the medical issues there, and we pray for uh, Dennis, Lord, as he's in a nursing home in uh, Fairview, and Lord, just ask for your hand in that. I know that that has been uh, very trying, uh, so we ask for prayer for Kathy as well as she works through all of that. Lord, we pray for the Nickerson family as they have experienced uh, just awful loss, tragic loss of their child and of their home, and Lord, just... Uh, we just pray over that situation. Uh, Lord, we are somewhat connected, and yet, um, Lord, we just pray that you would give us wisdom as a church and to figure out the best ways to help and to come alongside, and more importantly, Lord, to 
and that you would draw them close to you in this uh, uh, d this awful time. Lord, we thank you that uh, Vivian's brother Clifford is home, and Lord, we pray for the Bischoff family as they have suffered loss and uh, have went through uh, the the loss of uh, of Melissa. And Lord, just pray for them as well. And Lord, we pray for Donna this morning and for Al. Lord, I pray that you give him peace. Uh, Lord, he has no doubt in where he's going, and yet, uh, Lord, it's difficult to watch uh, people struggle. And so, Lord, we ask for your hand uh, in the midst of all that. I uh, ask your, for your hand on Donna and for peace for her as she makes decisions. And for our Lord, uh, if it's your will that you uh, um, pull him out of the pneumonia and the situation that he's got, uh, Lord, we just we would praise your name for that. And Lord, if it, if it isn't your will, then we ask uh, for peace in the midst of all of that. Uh, Lord, we pray for the rest of the family, his kids, and uh, Lord, just the, the whole situation is difficult. Lord, we pray for uh, Carol Renner as she has uh, surgery soon. Uh, Lord, and I just pray for uh, good results there. We pray, Lord, for Lucille's foot and the pain that she's having. And Lord, we pray for Janet as she continues to struggle with her cancer, that you would um, would come alongside there as well. And, and Lord, for Ken uh, Vanderhoof as he uh, continues to have a hard time in the hospital, Lord, I pray. Uh, I pray, Lord, for peace there, and, and Lord, that that agitation would go away. And uh, for your hand in that, that's difficult. And Lord, we pray for Brent that his that the uh, kidney stones would be blasted and would work this time. And Lord. Uh, we praise your name for Lonzo, and Lord, the this, this struggle has been a rough go, and yet um, he's been strong. And Lord, we just ask that you come alongside there as well. And we thank you that there's only one more treatment. Lord, we pray for a great result in November um, when the test is done. And, uh, Lord, we pray for, for Dad as he uh, dealing with uh, uh, sore back. I just pray that that would heal quickly, that he would uh, be back to being up and around. Lord, we do pray for our country and for wisdom as uh, we make decisions. And Lord, for good leadership. We see in today's passage uh, the value of leadership. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would um, put on the hearts of all those uh, who lead the reality of being a good example. And leading the, with their lives. And Lord, the difference that that makes. Lord, we pray for Lori Gaston as she deals with uh, some of the situations um, with Dan's uh, uh, check. And Lord, I just pray for her heart. I know it's uh, broken over the situation. We pray for Hazel as well as uh, she experiences that loss. And we ask uh, for, for comfort for Kelsey as she has uh, felt that as well. Lord, we pray for Tom and Deb as they uh, aren't here. And just, Lord... I uh, ask for a quick uh, cleanup, and Lord, if there's a, something that we can do as a church, I pray that you um, would put that on their heart to remind us. And Lord, we thank you for uh, Dom being able to get some surgery on his foot. Pray that that would take care of what's needed there. And Lord, we pray for James Hillier as he goes back in for or for uh, more uh, cancer treatment. We pray for Frankie as he is dealing with that. Pray for uh, Lord a match there. And Lord, we pray for uh, uh, Kenneth and Joy as they recover and their family, Lord, uh, and the scariness of that. And Lord, just uh, pray pray for Kenneth's ministry, Lord, as you uh, have called him to uh, great music ministry. And Lord, just pray that you'd strengthen him for that uh, that walk, uh, that difficult challenge of, of leading people. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, that this would be uh, quick. And uh, that they would go through that. And Lord, I just pray for their whole family. I don't know um, the whole situation, but you do. And you know, uh, Lord, what needs to happen there. Lord, we call upon you. We know you have it all figured out. Although we may not. We know that you are good. Lord, we thank you. And uh, we ask, Lord, even now that you open our hearts as we look at your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, troops. It is now 0700, and it's time to attack the enemy. Grease, grime, slime, sludge. And that's just Joey's room. <laughs> now, 
What is dirt? Dirt bad. I can't hear you. Dirt bad. Daddy's really into spring cleaning, isn't he? Steph, it may be spring cleaning to you and me, but to Dad, it's Christmas. Permission to whine? Permission denied. Get back in line, soldier. Yes, your spotlessness. <laughs> Look alive! Oh! Don't do that. I'm having a beautiful dream. We hired a cleaning service. Now, troops, you all have your assignments. Now, sound off. Up. If we find dirt, we will attack. If we, we find, find dirt, we will, will attack. attack. And we'll get Danny off our back. Danny off our back. Sound up. One, two. Sound up. Dirt bad. <sighs> I love the smell of Lysol in the morning. I kind of like that. Maybe I should turn on my mic. There we go. No, no. There we go. Sorry about that. So we haven't done this in a couple of weeks, but I do want to, uh, I, I think it's important. I appreciate those who, who read during the week and have um, taken the time to look at Ezra chapter 9. And so before we get started, I want to ask the question. Uh, I would love to know what you heard this week as you read the scripture. What, what stuck out in this passage? Because I have a direction I want to go today. But I also realize that there's a lot more pieces than just what I heard. Um, there's a lot of pieces that you may have heard. So there's some, some things that didn't fit in the sermon so well, so I didn't use them. Um, but they're still cool and important and helpful. So what did you hear in Ezra chapter 9 this week? Well, maybe nobody heard anything. <laughs> well, they, they, weren't, they weren't keeping to themselves. I mean, they were intermingling with their neighbors and stop doing the things that they shouldn't do. They weren't, right, they weren't listening, right? No. They didn't, they didn't do what God had told them to do from the very beginning. Absolutely. B? Their marriage wasn't acceptable to God, right? Which is kind of an interesting topic to talk about, because let's just stop, step, step outside this for a second. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I think family is really important. So for somewhere, for God to come in and say, listen, um, you need to be away with that woman or that man who is not of Jewish descent and break up a family seems kind of harsh and heavy on the, on the surface, does it not? I don't know about you guys, but we live in a different world uh, today than what they did then. I'm, I'm sure that they just moved in and uh, they went to the local watering hole and all kinds of young singles were there, and they hung out together, and they picked up a, a wife or a husband, and they got together, they had some kids, and they don't even, maybe even know what God had said, or they sure as heck probably didn't remember. And God's, God's standard was pretty harsh uh, in this setting, right? We're going to talk a little bit about why it was harsh for one, uh, but on the surface it's a little bit hard to say, you need to get away from that person, go find... You need to be away with them because you're, what the scripture says, making your people impure. Do you know why? Does anybody know why that, was, why that was a problem? Why the intermarrying was an issue? Religion. Religion. They were idol worshippers. See, a lot of times back then, people would marry into other, uh, into other tribes or other, other groups. You know Why? Because if I marry Jim's wa uh, daughter, he's not coming to kill me, right? Because he's not going to kill his own daughter and grandkids. And so they would do a lot of political, a lot of times they would do this political uh, um, agenda. They would marry into other tribes and they would intermarry. But what happens when we intermarry? What, what was God's problem with that situation? Does anybody know? What's that? Unyoked, okay. They, they definitely had this problem, and this is the problem we all have when we get married. And I'm not saying it's a... When I, before I got married, I had A, B, C, and D that I did for every holiday, right? And my wife had A, B, C, and D for every holiday, right? But what happens when you get married and begin to, you put those together? 
big fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, usually, right? There's usually a, there's a tug of war, at least, right? Or at least a big discussion. A big discussion. And, <laughs> and, but, but what happens at the end of the day? We blend them all together, right? I don't go to the four places I went before I was married. I probably go to two of those places. And we go to two of my wives, right? We begin to blend those things together. And so some of the things that we used to do, we don't do. And some of the things we do now are new traditions. And so that was part of what was going on here. Um, they had really gotten away from their faith in a very real way. They had gotten away, they had intermingled so much that their, their Jewish faith was no longer um, the faith. It was just one of the faiths. So you might have um, this idol worship uh, half and this Jewish faith half, and they tried to mix it together. And I don't know if you know what happens when you mix, uh, when you stir up uh, faiths and you just put them all together, you get, well, you get a mess no matter which way you go, right? Uh, really only, there's only one in my mind uh, religion, religion that is accepting of most all other religions, and that's because they have no values or standards, and that's Buddhism. So the Buddhists tend to be like, have what you have at it, do what you want, and we'll just throw everything together. But but as in the Christian faith, we have standards, and there's a reason we have standards, and it's a good thing. So if we hear anything else in this passage before we get started this morning, anybody Guilt. else hear anything? Guilt. Ill. Guilt. Guilt. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot of guilt, right? There's a question, uh, the question that was posed in a commentary this week. It says, if you read verse 1, it says, the priests came to Ezra and let them know what was going on. But it also says the leaders of the people were doing exact, they were leading uh, these people. Down. Obviously, the leaders of the, of the people were intermarrying, teaching their kids to intermarry. And so when Ezra got there, so let's step back for a second. Ezra takes this nice trip with all these people, brings all the Levites like we picked up last week, right? Brings them all there, smooth sailing. We get there. We got all the money we need. Nothing bad has happened. We sit down. <sighs> Take a breath, right? We got a new temple. We got a new wall. And someone shows up at the door. And it's these priests. Whether they're secular priests or part of the Israelites, it doesn't say in the scripture. But they say, listen, this is what you're walking. Everybody ever walk into something that was twice as bad as you thought it was going to be? Oh, yeah. This will only take five minutes, and five hours later, you're still working on it? That's just what's going on, right? Ezra walks in and thinks he's going to have, I got all these people, all I got to do is teach them, right? We learned that last week. And he realizes that the people that he's walking into is a mess. All these people had intermarried. And they have a mess on it. He has a mess on his hands. So much so... Then what does he do? What's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we said. He, did you, he rips his clothes, right? Tears his cloak and tunic, which that may not seem like any, anything to us who have three, uh, three closets full of clothes. But I don't think it was that way then. You know what I mean? They didn't have 20 sets of cloaks and tunics. Um, ripping your clothes was kind of ridiculous. But very serious. And then he pulled his hair out, which Danny Lyons told me in first service. That wouldn't work very well for him because he doesn't have much left on top. I, I feel his pain. And he pulled out the hair in his beard. Because his guilt, it says, was so big. Because they had not kept themselves from being intermingled. Anything else stick out in this passage before we move along? God didn't punish them the way they deserved. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, if you get to the end of this passage, we're going to finish up the sermon there. God didn't punish them. Ezra's prayer was, thank you, God, for not killing us all, because that's what we deserved. Thank you for giving us, and he uses this cool word, and I'm not going to talk much about it today, but I, I encourage you to look back at this. He says, thank you for allowing us a remnant. And you'll see in Old Testament... There's this, this idea of a remnant, of thread, of God's people. Even when things are not good and there's, it goes from a big bunch of people to hardly any people, there's a remnant, a thread of people uh, who still follow God. 
And he says, thank you for not taking us out. You should have, and you could have destroyed us. And yet you didn't. Thank you, Lord, for that. So I want to I want to begin here. This passage, if you read this passage, it's heavy. It's not only heavy, it's hard. And when we talk about sin, that's difficult. Um, we're good at seeing everybody else's sin. We're great at good at seeing everybody else's sin. If you need me to tell you what yours is, I, I'm, I probably could figure it out. Right? <laughs> right, find somebody who knows. We're really bad at seeing our own. We're not real good at digging in enough to understand where we have problems. I, I titled this Spring Cleaning mostly because what do you do in spring cleaning that you don't do any other time of the year? Throw it away. Throw it away? Okay, you get rid of it. You scrub. I hate spring cleaning, by the way, right? I like to just take the broom, <laughs> blow it out, I'm good. Spring cleaning means you move things, you scrub, you get on your hands and knees. You remember, you, you, I might date myself, but I remember my mom and dad telling me, use a little elbow grease, right? Well, what the heck is elbow grease? Kenny told me it was, uh, if you work really hard, you can make some grease in your elbow. I, I, I have to trust him. He's not here to defend himself. So. Yeah, and clean all those many windows. All those things, right. You do those things that you maybe not, it's not a once over it's making sure you got everything cleaned up. Uh, and you might only, a lot of times we always did it in the spring. At the end of a long time of a long year. And I know you're going to have a hard time believing this, uh, but God's people have strayed again. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. I know you guys have never strayed. I just... <laughs> I'm really good at pointing my finger at the Israelites because God's got all these different examples. I said, come on, guys, get it right. Well, Ezra says, listen, I, I am tearing out my hair. He says, I lay, and well, in the prayer, he says, I lay uh, prostrate. It doesn't, what, it's not what it says, but he, he lays on his hands and knees with his face to the ground, and he says, I will not even look up. I know for some of us, if we got down there, we wouldn't get back up, right? We'd have to build a, 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 a pulley system to pull ourselves back up. But the reality is, when is the last time that we have recognized the sin in our lives uh, to that serious uh, of an account that we, um, we were crushed in our spirits like that? Maybe, maybe, maybe we just take our sin way, way, way too easily. And... Uh, make for cheap grace because we don't recognize the need to change. And so that's the first thing that uh, sticks out in this passage. Ezra realizes that there's, there is sin amongst us and I'm responsible for fixing it. Not only am I responsible for fixing it, but I've got to go to God and, and cry out and apologize for what is going on. And so that's what he does. He, he goes and he recognizes that uh, this is bad stuff. And then we're going to have to do something different. See, he, he remembers the scripture, which obviously the exiles didn't or chose not to. It says, um, the Lord has told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because you will surely uh, turn your hearts after their gods. Never, and this is when Solomon did it. Nevertheless, Solomon uh, held fast to them in love. Solomon couldn't walk away either. Sometimes our sin uh, gets in the way. Well, not, not sometimes, all the times our sin gets in the way. One of the things I've noticed as I've gotten older is that um, my view has gotten smaller. I don't know if, I, I always used to make fun of old people because I was like, they're set in their ways. And now I'm old people. <laughs> I'm working on being old people. I'm like, I like to be set in my ways. I enjoy doing the same thing for breakfast and uh, for lunch and for supper and going to bed at the same time and getting, I enjoy getting, I've been, for whatever reason, it feels comfortable to be kind of set in my ways. But I wonder this, if sometimes I don't use that as an excuse not to change. Like, this is just who I am. 
This is who God made me out to be. This is the way God made me, and I'm just going to live with it for the rest of my life. Or maybe I'm too old to change. I don't have enough time to change. Or maybe I just have tunnel vision, and I choose not to see what else is out there. If we're honest with ourselves, when I said that uh, we all have sin, uh, if even you thought, well, I don't know what mine is, well, you've already made a mistake, right? We all continue to have sin in our lives. Now, we work on it. But Scripture tells us that we're going to continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And, and to me, that means that there are going to be some things that we still struggle with. We struggle with our thoughts. We struggle with the way we treat others or, or maybe the way we speak to others. Maybe we struggle with, uh, with being uh, caring and giving. I guarantee that we all have something. See, and he said, don't forget. Don't forget. This is a time to rebuild. You remember when we talked earlier, the first six chapters of Ezra was about the temple. Don't forget, we're going to rebuild the temple. Now we're going to rebuild God's people. So we have something to put in the temple. So we have a checklist. Because in order to do spring cleaning, you've got to have a, a list of the things that you need to do to make the change. And if you don't recognize that there is sin in your life, that's the first step. Uh, one of the things I think works really well is that we all have friends or family, right? We have someone in our life we trust. If you don't, let me know. I'll try to find you. We'll hook you up. Those are people we trust for a reason. We trust that their judgment is good. And I'd be willing to bet if you don't know where your sin struggles are, and I, I'm pretty sure you probably do, that someone you care about might be willing to help you walk through that. Because Understanding where we struggle helps us to move and grow and be closer to God. Because if we don't recognize it, we sure as heck can't change it. The second part is to change our attitude. Do you see Ezra's attitude once he found out about God's people? I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift my face to you. That's in verse 6. Because our sins are higher than our heads. We're underwater in our sins. And our guilt has reached the heavens. You've got to be willing to change it. If you aren't willing to change it, you will continue to suffer with it. I just wonder, and I, I wonder how many times we lug our baggage in that door on Sunday morning with every hope in us to walk, to drudge, to, to walk around, sit in our seat, and drop that baggage off here before we leave. And we run out of, and we get chicken, and we don't. And you know what we do? We carry that sucker right back out the entrance, all the way back out to our car, load it in the trunk, and we save it till next week when we'll come back through the door. And boy, if, if God didn't give us uh, baggage and just put some like 80 pounds in it, you know? Wouldn't that be a cool illustration on God's part? Alright, if you want to carry this, this baggage around in your life, I'm going to make it a little more real for you. I'm going to put this baggage on, a, on the end of a rope and I'm going to tie it to uh, your waist. And then every time you go uh, to the altar or the church, you have an opportunity to leave it at the altar or you can drag it back out the door if you'd like. And I bet a, a whole bunch of us would say, whole lot easier leaving my baggage here in this pile than to take it back out. But God didn't design it with 80 pounds of baggage to carry in and out. And yet I watch Christians who can't find joy in their life because the baggage has gotten so heavy. The baggage is so heavy that they can't see that there's there's something good to be lived in this world. Not because of the world, but rather because we have eternal life. 
So I encourage you, if you have friends, those you trust, I have had people come to me and say, this is the hardest, I don't really want to tell you this, but I need to tell you this. And it was hard. This scripture is out of Proverbs 27. It said, says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. But the enemy multiplies kisses. That means you can tell me lots of nice fluffy things and make me feel good about myself. Or you can tell me the truth. Because I ain't all that. And none of us are. That's kind of hard. It is hard. And yet, I, gotta, I wanna give you an example of, uh, I had an epiphany over last weekend. And I don't know if I used it, I don't think I used it last week. I, uh, but I was with a friend that I hadn't seen in a bunch of years and we used to hang out. We used to go to their church for 15, 15 years ago we went to their church. And we left there, went to a few other places for short term, ended up here, now we're 15 years later. I'm spending time with him and his family. Uh, and I come to this real realization that had we not left, mind you, it took us two years to leave. We were the last of, of our family to leave, and it was really hard and painful. Had we not left, we would never have gotten here. We would never. I probably would never have gone back to school. I probably would not be doing full-time ministry. All these things all changed because we made one step, one step of faith. The step of faith was this. Even though we went kicking and screaming, we knew God was saying, listen, you need to change. You need a different attitude, a different direction in your life. And finally, we made, we made that decision. And when I was with my friend, I realized 15 years would have been gone by and things would have just been the same. It would have been the same as it was 15 years ago had I not left, had I not changed, had I not heard God's voice in, in the fact that He was telling us, you need to make a step and move. You need to go. So I encourage you, those areas of your life that you're struggling with, to lay them at His feet and give Him a chance. I want to talk just a minute about empathy. Does anybody know what, empathy, what the definition of empathy is? Yep. What is it? Understanding and feeling what the other person is. Very good, yes, exactly. I, you were reading my notes. The ability to understand and share the feelings of another person. Let me give you an example. When someone's parent or uh, family member passes, we feel sad, right? But when we have that happen, now we've experienced it. And so now, we, now when someone says that, we can fully understand that sense. That's empathy. Understanding and feeling uh, another person's pain or struggle or trial. And there are some things we have a hard time because we've, like, we're not gonna go through that. Or we haven't gone through that. And so we have to seek God in that. How, God, can I be empathetic? How can I be empathetic to someone who uh, is hurting um, with something I've never experienced? I don't have time to read it, but I want you to, if you're interested in that, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, talks about, Paul talks about um, working um, to be more empathetic, to win those by uh, beginning to understand and feel that uh, the hurt that others have. And finally, we have to stop the cycle. As hard as that would be in this situation, the only way they were going to fix this was to not intermarry anymore. The scripture says, uh, God, shall we break God's commandments and intermarry with people again? No, we don't do it anymore, and we break off the situations we have. Well, that's the passage right there. No more. We have to walk away or be willing to walk away. 
I want to talk just a minute about the altar. As I talked about the baggage we bring. Sometimes we know the baggage and we're afraid to talk about it or we don't want to share it or we sure wouldn't want anybody to think we were weak enough that we'd have to bring it to the altar, that our, that our baggage would be big enough. And yet I wonder how many people walk in and out of here living in anger, living in frustration or fear or disillusionment, hate, uh, envy, Overcome by sorrows, pain that no one understands, brokenness, all this baggage that weighs us down. I don't believe, I, we talked last week, I don't believe the, that we won't have anything of that, but I think it's how we deal with it and how we walk this path. There will be a burden on us. That's part of the faith. But we don't have to live crushed by that burden. We have the ability to bring that to the altar. You have the ability, before you leave this morning, to bring that struggle to the altar and pray over that, that pain that's, that's whatever is driving uh, the hurt. Or, or if you'd rather, I love God giving us free will. If you'd rather, you can drag it back out the door. See, because God sent His Son Jesus not to make us feel miserable, or to think uh, that he's the heavy-handed God, but rather he sent Jesus that we might have freedom, Scripture says, freedom through him. And that means that when we have sin that needs to be out of our life, it's not because God is saying, you know what, I don't want you to enjoy that anymore, so I want, I want to take that away from you. That's not it at all. What, he real, what he's telling us is, listen, that is damaging you. It's making it worse. You're not getting better, you're, you're, doing, uh, you're doing more harm to yourself. And I want to help you walk away from the things that hurt you. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you want to come to the altar and pray that God will take the baggage that you're struggling with, whatever it is, I want to encourage you to do that. If you haven't met Jesus, if you haven't started a relationship with Him, a relationship that would allow you to recognize, even in your life, his spirit moving. That's, I, don't leave without an opportunity to do that. Don't leave without talking to someone next to you or near you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that Ezra recognized the seriousness of what was going on around him. And that Lord, he didn't take it lightly. He took that guilt upon himself and that pain of all the, the struggles that were going on there. He recognized, Lord, that your hand was in his life and on the situation. And Lord, uh, it tore him up. Lord, if we're, if we're allowing sin to rule the day in our life, it will tear us up. It will tear us apart. We won't function correctly. Lord, I ask even now that you would remind us of those areas that we have sinned, that we have struggled, and that we have not been able to give to you. Lord, if we need to say we're sorry, if we need to apologize, if we need, Lord, to build, relate, make a relationship we've broken, or break a relationship that we've stayed in too long, Lord, you don't call us to anything but the best. And too often we settle for mediocre. So Lord, I ask this morning, draw us to the best. Take that sin out of our lives and Lord, build us a new creation. That's what we are, new creations in this world. Build us to that. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would please st uh, stand up for stand up for stand up for Jesus in four seven.